This is an interview with Sergeant William Harley Branch. Mr. Branch was born in Atlanta, Georgia in the year of 1933. Mr. Branch served from September of 1952 to June of 1955 in the 82nd Airborne in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Mr. Branch achieved the rank of Sergeant. This interview is being done on the 5th of December of 2013 in Loomis, California. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress as part of Da Vinci High School's America at War Project. Alright, so Mr. Branch, we just have a few biographical questions for you. So sure. where and when were you born? I was born in 1933 in Atlanta, Georgia. Alright, so when you were growing up, what was it like? Uh, we have a few things, so maybe your parents, or, and what were their occupations, how many siblings did you have? Um, I uh, grew up in the uh, what today is the well-known Buckhead section of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my father uh, in those days was uh, a lawyer who um, volunteered um, in World War II uh, as a Navy officer. Uh, and we moved to various places in the country during World War II uh, as part of his Navy career. Uh, in later years, he became a utility uh, company executive. Uh, he was president of the Georgia Power Company, uh, and he was president and later chairman of the board of the Southern Company that owns, uh, five, I believe, five different power companies in the Southeast, Georgia Power Company, Alabama Power Company, um, a Florida Power Company, Missis Mississippi Power Company. All right, so other than your father, did you have any other close friends or family that were in the military at the time? Uh, well, in World War II, and that's one of the interesting aspects of the story, in World War II, everybody had somebody they knew or more likely even a member of their own family that was in the war because it was a war that everybody was in uh, because we were fighting for our country's very survival as opposed to other wars. So, yes, uh, I, I had uh, not friends. I was too young. I was... Uh, age 10, 11, 12 uh, during World War II, so I didn't have any immediate friends, but I had uh, plenty of acquaintances and family members. All my family members virtually were in the war. All right, so we definitely found your haircut very interesting. Is there a story <laughs> behind that? Uh, in interestingly enough, there is, and it, it kind of indirectly relates to what you're asking about the Korean War. Um, I. Um, I was, a, I was a kid, had been a kid, as I said, during World War II, uh, age 10, 11, 12, when the war was on. And um, the, um, this haircut, the, uh, the Mohawk haircut, everybody thinks it was the, uh, uh, the punk rockers or whatever that introduced it. Actually, very few people know this, but you'll find it documented all over the internet. Uh, the haircut was in first introduced by the paratroopers in World War II. Uh, members of the 101st Airborne Division adopted it when they were parachuted across the English Channel and dropped behind Nazi lines uh, just, uh, I think, about six hours before the Normandy invasion. Uh, they adopted the haircut, and there are a lot of pictures on the internet of uh, 101st Airborne paratroopers with the haircut because, they, as silly as it sounds, somebody thought it would supposedly frighten the Nazis. <laughs> well, lots of luck, but uh, somebody believed that. And um, that, was, that was the other big Airborne Division, the 101st. My Airborne Division, the 82nd Airborne Division, did not have the haircut during World War II, but they did uh, frequently adopt it. It became associated with all paratroopers, and the 82nd, uh, when I was in the 82nd during the Korean War, they, they weren't allowed to have this haircut, obviously, on garrison duty when you had very strict uniform regulations. But in the summertime, when I was there at Fort Bragg, when the division went on summertime maneuvers out in the backcountry of Fort Bragg, this huge backcountry area, uh, whole... Uh, whole regiments of the 82nd would adopt the Mohawk haircut while they were on uh, maneuvers. So uh, uh, I always liked it when I was there in, uh, in the 82nd. 
And um, when I, obviously with a career, I, I couldn't go through a career with this, but when I uh, retired about five years ago, I just decided to have some fun and go back to it again. Not not trying to, to relate it to the military or relive military experiences. I just happened to like it from those days. But it does relate back to the paratroop uh, duty. So why did you choose to enlist in the Army? Were there any specific reasons such as family, friends, or was it just personal? You wanted to do that? Well, that's a complicated story and hopefully uh, uh, perhaps an interesting story. Um, as I mentioned, I, I was a, a kid of age 10, 11, 12 during World War II, and uh, I, I've always felt and still feel very strongly to this day, as, as Tom Brokaw called it, that generation that went to war in World War II. I was just a, a kid, but the older generation that went to war was indeed, as Brokaw put it, the greatest generation. I, I can't think of enough nice things to say about the sacrifices those people made. And in World War II, as, a, as opposed, there hasn't been any other war like it since then, in that in World War II, the entire nation went to war. Uh, and it's still, I, I've got to confess, it still bothers me very much to this day that we have now fought three, at least three or four wars after that, uh, the Korean War, the, um, well, less, to a lesser extent, the Korean War, because we did have draftees in the Korean War, which, uh, uh, and the Vietnam War, we have not had, I believe, since, since the Vietnam War. Um, but I'd always felt that it, it was, it was a feeling that was indescribable to a child like me with, when the entire nation went to war. We, we had, we had training in our elementary school classrooms on how to put out, uh, incendiary bombs with a bucket of sand as if we could have, little kids could have done very much against an incendiary bomb, but we, we did have the training. And uh, the entire nation went through gasoline rationing, food rationing. Food was rationed. You couldn't get sugar. You couldn't get coffee. Women couldn't get nylon stockings. The entire nation, and there were posters all over the country reminding us that the entire nation was at war, whether it was Rosie the Riveter working in an aircraft factory or whether it was uh, somebody making munitions or just somebody buying war bonds everywhere. There were, you know, help save the country, buy war bonds, because most people don't realize it, but we probably came that close to losing the greatest, the most momentous war of all, World War I, because we were not prepared for World War II. We were totally unprepared. Our, our, we had no, uh, very few combat airplanes. The Congress had not been willing to pass appropriations to build an air force. Uh, our army had been cut back to just a, a, a phantom peacetime army. Uh, we were just beginning to build up when Pearl Harbor came. But in the first Few, and th this is something a kid like me remembers from World War II, the fear that we just maybe we're going to lose the war, that we were, it's, the, it's the only, there's been no other war since World War II when this country was actually afraid of being invaded. As, as Even as children, we were warned the Nazis would very likely invade America, the Japanese even more likely. There were Nazi submarines uh, 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 sunk just, I think, a couple of miles off the coast within our territorial waters around New York and New England and other places. On the West Coast, we had fire bombs floating in by balloons that were setting off forest fires in Oregon and California and I think maybe Washington. The entire nation was at war. And war is, make no mistake about it, war obviously is horrible. Killing people is horrible. But nevertheless, having said that, the feeling of patriotism, and this is going to sound corny, but I'm sorry, I just feel that strongly about it, the feeling of patriotism of even little kids, because we were all in this together for our very survival. It wasn't until maybe halfway through World War II that we began to realize we probably were going to win it. We had first thought we very likely were going to lose the war, and in which case, we would probably be living today under Nazis uh, uh, that would have taken over the country. We, we came that close. 
Um, so in answer to your question, why, why did I volunteer in the Korean War? Uh, having been a child of, of, of the greatest generation, uh, <laughs> I, oh, yeah, I, sorry, I get a little teary-eyed over this, but patriotism meant so much to us. I don't mean to sound corny. I'm not a right-winger or anything like that. But genuine patriotism meant so much to us that as corny as it sounds, the biggest thrill I ever had in my life, corny as it sounds, I was at, at, uh, at Davidson College, North Carolina, um, before the Korean War, between the wars, I was in an ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps unit, um, at the college. And every week we had dress parade uh, that with a complete with a band, and we all had to stand out on the parade ground and go to present arms while the band played the, the national anthem. I, I get a little teary eyed thinking about it. And the feeling. The rush, I'll never forget it. Every time it happened, this electric feeling of not, cor not phony patriotism, but genuine feeling for what this country meant and for how important it was what all of us were doing for the country. Uh, I, I've never, the rest of my life, experienced a feeling like those moments standing there with the national anthem being played uh, uh, at, um, at Present Arms. And so when the Korean War came along, that was the first war after the greatest generation. That was the first war after World War II. By that time, I was of age to join the military. I was 19 years old. Uh, uh, the draft was on at that time. I, I could have dodged the draft very easily, could have gotten a college deferment. I was in college. But because of the thrill of all of us doing something for our country in World War II, I, I felt, rightly or wrongly, the, 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 the re motivations for the Korean War, as you well know, are, are under fierce debate even today, whether we were or we did or did not do the right thing by, uh, by, uh, by taking military action there. The North, all I knew was that we were told that North Korea had invaded South Korea, that they supposedly were, uh, communism was threatening to take over the, the world. Uh, it was being presented that way. And corny as it sounds, I just wanted to be a part of that. Uh, maybe I was this corny, uh, starry-eyed kid, naive kid, but that's the way I felt. So everybody thought I was crazy. Instead of waiting to be drafted, I volunteered for the regular army, and I volunteered for the, for the paratroops, for the airborne division. And um, in my basic training outfit at Fort uh, Jackson, South Carolina, the, the 8th Infantry Division, which was a basic training division, I think I was one maybe of only out of, a, of, an, of an entire company of how many people in a company uh 200 people something like that i think uh i was one of maybe only two or three soldiers in that basic training company that had volunteered Every, all the rest of them were were um were draftees and they all thought i was crazy because um they said and this is maybe kind of an interesting sidelight to it uh they kidded me unmercifully about being my serial number was R A one four blah 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 meaning regular army all of theirs was U S blah 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 for draftees they kidded me unmercifully about being R A regular army and they kept saying the isn't the Korean War dangerous enough for you we're probably all going to end up in combat in Korea that's not dangerous enough you want to volunteer for even more dangerous so-called hazardous duty which is what they termed it in those days as a paratrooper and they said you, you got to be crazy well the irony of it is this is getting a little ahead of the story the irony of it is that when I graduated from basic training right at the very height of the Korean War I I think most of my unit let me double check this for you I think it was, if I remember correctly, the chosen reservoir time of really a critical time. The, the U.S. was desperate for troops. Uh, they didn't have enough troops. Uh, 
And we got notified at near the end of our basic training at, near Christmas of 1952. We got notified that our entire basic training company, they didn't even have time to give us a Christmas furlough, which we had all expected. They shipped our unit directly from basic training the day we graduated. Bingo, they shipped us with no furlough to Fort Washington, uh, Fort Lewis, Washington for uh, shipment on troop ships to, to Korea. That was before they were doing aircraft, a lot of aircraft transitions. And so the irony of it is, after all these guys... Um, kidded me about being so stupid with the date for volunteering for more dangerous duty my paratroop unit ended up getting kept in reserve not sent to combat all of those other guys went not just into combat but bitter combat i think maybe the chosen reservoir not sure uh and i heard reports back i can't verify this but we we those of us that have been in the unit heard reports later that a huge proportion of the guys I went through basic training with died uh, in the Korean War. I think this sounds a bit wild, but I think we were hearing something like like 60% of them maybe died in combat. I, that may be wildly exaggerated, but a huge number of them. So the irony of is that I, supposedly the one volunteering for the more hazardous duty, lucked out ended up living through the war because my unit didn't go. Those guys that thought I was so dumb for making a mistake ended up dying in the war uh, in a pretty horrible war. All right, so you talked about the Chosen Reservoir. Could you explain more on that or elaborate more about what that was? Camp Pro I think my unit was involved in that. I'd have to research that a little more. The Chosen Reservoir, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, and this was not just the Army, it was the Marine Corps particularly involved in that. But the Chosen Reservoir was when, as best I recall, uh, double check me on this, uh, uh, mil some American military units got stranded in the dead of winter. Bitter cold, I mean incredibly untold coldness. Guys just literally freezing to death. Uh, at the Chosen Reservoir, and the Americans had to send rescue units in. To, they were pinned down. They were ambushed. It was a horrible situation. Uh, and uh, I'm not absolutely positive the Army units were involved. I know the Marine Corps was. I think they were also, and I think that was maybe my unit uh, in that. But it was, it was one of the most, one of the worst ordeals of the Korean War. So going back to you had been talking about patriotism and your opinion on that, I, I really liked the description you gave of it, but do you think that it's sort of changed or it's even lost in modern day now, or do you think it's the same of the way you feel? I, I do. I, I do very much. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not implying that younger generation uh, isn't, isn't, uh, isn't patriotic. Uh, they are. But uh, I, I, I do greatly miss that feeling of the entire country coming to the nation's uh, defense, which we haven't had since then. And this is a different part of the story you may or may not, may not be interested in, but I do honestly believe it's a mistake that we no longer have the draft. Uh, I think we should have universal military training. I think all of us should I'm not, I'm not blaming any of your generation that doesn't we don't have it we don't have the draft so i don't blame you guys uh for not wanting to get into some pretty pretty uh horrible combat experiences in afghanistan iraq and uh now who knows syria or wherever uh, don't blame them a bit but i think the country and and the the younger generation loses something from that i, I it's kind of a tough balance because the Iraq War and the Afghanistan War in particular have sadly wrecked so many lives of so many young Americans that are, I mean, an incredible number of veterans of those two wars that are suffering severe post-traumatic uh, 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 symptoms. Um, it, it, it's left so many of those people horribly maimed, psychologically damaged, and I would not minimize that. But on the other hand, I do think, as horrible as that 
aspect of it is I think we lose something as a country when everybody or almost everybody isn't deeply involved in, in, in protecting uh, our, our country. So I'm going to go back to your talking more about your regiment. Uh, what was training camp like for that regiment? Because I think I would think airborne is sort of different from a general cavalry like, or basic. Uh, it, it is. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there were two different aspects of, of training. One was basic training. Since I was a paratroop volunteer, an Army Airborne volunteer, we were required to go through 16 weeks of basic. Uh, a lot of other people only had to go through half that much basic training, eight, eight, uh, eight weeks of basic training. But since uh, Army paratroop units are basically infantry units, we had to go through the full infantry training. Then after you graduated from uh, basic training, uh, to be a paratrooper, you had to, and I'm sure still today, you had to go to so-called jump school. So I was uh, was sent to uh, after basic training, and and after I was, uh, well, basically after after basic training, I was sent to um, paratroop training, uh, airborne to, to jump school at Fort Benning, Georgia, which I hadn't mentioned, which was uh, a three-week, very intensive course of. Uh, uh, very physically demanding. If you've ever seen the the TV series, um, the Band of Brothers about the 101st, it shows the training they went through at the long gone Camp Tacoa, Georgia, for World War II. Intensive training uh, they had to go through. Um, so uh, yeah, so I went through separate jump school after basic training. All right. So how was adapting to military life? How, how how did you do that, and what did you do to maybe stay in touch with family while you were in training? Uh, my family was great. They they corresponded with me. Um, I was I I couldn't get home very much during basic training. We were very particularly since they were racing to get us trained for the deteriorating situation in in Korea. We didn't get much opportunity to take furloughs during basic training. But once it was over, I was close enough to Atlanta that um, I could occasionally get down uh, to Atlanta uh, uh, several hours drive. But basic training. Uh, I, I, I got to admit to you, it was particularly for a Southerner, and, and this, is, this is a different aspect of it. Tell me if you don't want to go into this, but it's maybe socially relevant. You have to remember, this was in the days of total segregation, in that this was a Deep South training camp. Uh, almost, all, almost all of the guys in my... Uh, uh, training company of a couple of hundred uh, people. Uh, almost all of them were f from the deep south. We had never, segregation was still, n nobody, integration was, except for the army, and I'll get to that, wasn't, hadn't even been thought of. That was before Brown versus Board of Education. Everything was rigidly segregated, and like every southern kid, I was, I was never a rabid segregationist. No, no my family would never taught us taught us never to get involved in that sort of stuff but nevertheless we we grew up as segregationists because nobody knew anything different nobody had even suggested anything different till board uh, brown versus board of education came along while i was uh at uh, at fort bragg in the 82nd which is a, an interesting story maybe so my basic training company from a kid coming out of the segregated south my basic training company was probably 75% blacks out of the deep south that I had never, I mean, we had, you know, family uh, blacks that, that, you know, that were uh, an integral, often an integral part of southern families, but not where you lived with them 24 hours a day, bathed, ate, uh, went to the bathroom, uh, all together. And I can't tell you how, looking back on it, it, I'm glad it happened. It was a good thing, but it was, it was a pretty traumatic experience adapting for the first time in your life to it, with 75% blacks in the company, it was a black culture that I was suddenly immersed in the middle of with no preparation. And it, was, it took some pretty fast uh, adapting to that. 
uh, it was it was while I was in the 82nd later after I got out of basic that Brown versus Board of Education came down uh, and I was still I just was born a segregationist I'm not now uh, totally the opposite but the Supreme Court decision uh, on school desegregation was handed down when I was at Fort Bragg, again, living with, uh, with blacks. And by this time, I had adapted to it very well uh, and understood the culture. Uh, and at first, when that Supreme Court decision came down as a guy in the 82nd, I was initially opposed to it. That was pretty stupid, but I, I grew up that way. But within, I'm proud to say that within... A month or two after the Supreme Court decision, I totally flip-flopped, totally changed my mind, and said, whoa, this is the right decision. It's absolutely right. I was brought up to believe in Jeffersonian democracy. Uh, 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 all men are created equal. And for the it had never occurred to me that maybe all men weren't uh, treated equally. Pretty stupid, but I, I, I didn't realize. So within a month or two afterward, I totally flipped off, flip-flopped, ended up being the only kid later, uh, uh, after getting out of the Army, I ended up being the only kid in a Deep South college that was openly an integrationist. So I did a complete flip-flop. Uh, um, but you, you can perhaps understand how tr it was. The barracks were filled with black music I had never heard, with black lingo uh, that I had to adapt to. I'm glad I did. Best thing that ever happened to me. And, and it's all due to, uh, to President Harry Truman. A lot of people don't realize this, that just before the Korean War, or maybe, maybe at the very beginning of the Korean War, uh, he didn't wait for Congress to desegregate the army. He issued, most people don't know this, he issued an executive order where he, President Truman, said, from this day henceforth, the U.S. military is fully integrated. It, it, it infuriated the Deep South. It touched off violence, as you know, in the horrible violence in the Deep South. It was the most courageous thing President Truman, perhaps that any American president ever did. It was absolutely the right thing, but boy, was it traumatic. Uh, so, would you have any stories or memories that you that are directly you can remember from training with a multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, army regiment? That's a very good question. Um, Probably not too much beyond what I just told you, the, the living with uh, getting used to black music uh, full time in the barracks uh, that I'd, I'd never even heard before. Uh, basically blues and, and um, oh, I remember one of them was a song which nobody ever heard of today called Lordy, 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 Miss Claudie, <laughs> a black song. Uh, uh, that was at, uh, popular at, among blacks at the height of the war. It was played endlessly uh, in the barracks. And I had never heard music like, like that before. Uh, they were great guys. Uh, and I'll have, to, I'll have to give them credit that considering what we Southern whites put them through in the days of segregationists, they were great guys to be for the most part there were rare exceptions but for the most part they were friendly toward us they accepted us whites uh they they didn't show resentment unless you got uh on um unless you got on the subject of racism and then they would as they probably sh properly should have they would let you know that they were not going to tolerate it they had to tolerate it in those days in civilian life but they didn't on an army base and um, I'll tell you an embarrassing story. I don't think I've ever told anybody before, and this is very embarrassing. I was absolutely stupid, but um, <laughs> true confession time. When I was in basic training, there was a bunk mate of mine, a, a couple of bunks down from me in the in the barracks, a really, really nice black kid who was a graduate of, I believe, Spelman College in Atlanta, which was the great black uh, university uh, that is still famous today for so much of black heritage. Uh, brilliantly smart kid, 
highly educated, really nice kid. And this was utter stupidity on my part. But it's, it's all I knew in those days. And his name was... His name was Ware. His last name was Ware, W-A-R-E. And we got in a conversation in the barracks one day about integration somehow while we were living it every day. And he was a, he was a buck private like I was a recruit. And he told me that, that some words to the effect that Someday we were going to have integration in civilian life as well as military and that it was the right thing to say. And I am horribly embarrassed to tell you that I said I, I didn't mean ill will from it. It's all I knew. But I said, uh, Private Ware, whatever his name was, I said, I, I'm a little concerned by that. And he said, why? And I said, that sounds communistic to me. Stupid statement, utter stupidity, but I said it. Uh, because that was it. That was in the days not only of segregationists, it was in the McCarthyite days. Senator McCarthy was riding high. He had the, even the army he had on trial, probably because he didn't like their integrationists, accusing high-ranking army generals and even the president of being communistic. It was a horrible, horrible time. And sadly... Like so many young Southerners, I absorbed some of that. So I made this what I thought innocent remark. Well, well, private wear that that I, I'm sorry that sounds kind of communistic to me. Well, he reported it to our company commander, as he probably should have. I was called on the carpet by the company commander, saying, "Don't you ever, ever uh, insult." a black soldier in our unit by saying something. I had no idea I'd insulted him. I had, but I was stupid enough not to even know I'd offended him. I thought I was just making a statement of fact. I will never forget that embarrassment till the day I die, but that's kind of emblematic of the cultural shock uh, that we went through. The other aspect, if I'm not taking too much time on your answer, and this ties back to the, the feeling that that was the first war where... The country didn't care. We, we, in, in World War II, soldiers would go on leave. They were, we invited them into our homes. I remember Sunday dinners in World War II. You'd invite soldiers from the military camps to come share Christmas dinner, Sunday dinner with you. None of that happened suddenly in the Korean War. Uh, you would go in civilian life. No Civilians didn't want anything to do with you. They didn't care that you were in the military. You pretty quickly found out you were better off not wearing your uniform uh, when you were off duty. And beyond that, and this goes to your question of what it was like in basic training, the other aspect besides the cultural shock was that I'm embarrassed for my country to say this, but it's absolutely true. The morale in Army basic training camps at the height of the Korean War was it was plunged. It was rock bottom. It was, it was, it was depressing. Uh, people were committing suicide probably because we had draftees. We had one. We had one soldier in in my basic training company that was totally unsuited to be a soldier. He was a draftee. Uh, he was. Uh, he had been. Um, I, I, he, you, you could tell at first glance he was totally unsuited. Bless his heart. Just He was not the soldier type. And he was so depressed over it, as a lot of the other guys in the company were. He tried, This sounds ridiculous. He tried to commit suicide, we were told, in the furnace room of the barracks with an entrenching tool. Now, how you can commit suicide with a dull entrenching tool, I wouldn't even want to try it but the accusation was that he had tried to it was an entrenching tool was a, a foxhole digging tool I guess it probably had a sharp fairly sharp point on it he tried supposedly tried to cut his guts out with an entrenching tool in the furnace room because he was so depressed and so many other guys were I was considered stupid I was gung-ho they kidded me about being gung-ho they, they ended up at the end of the war calling me Sergeant Ho which does not mean what it does to the younger it meant Sergeant Gung-ho uh, but I, I was I, I'm not bragging I just as a matter of fact I was one of the few people 
in in the basic training company. Now, now the 82nd, and this is a, another aspect you might possibly be interested in, why I volunteered for the paratroops, was partly because of that that horrible morale problem in the troops that were being shipped, uh, being knew they were being shipped to the foxholes. Slight aside, and, and this maybe is an incident that answers your question. I remember I had volunteered out of this probably very naive feeling of patriotism, whatever, wanting to be a part of what I thought at the time was was a, a, a legitimate war effort. And um, the I, re, I will never forget to this day the moment in basic training, well, I think it was when we were having bayonet training, when you're being taught to bayonet straw men fixed up to 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 be like real people and taught where to drive the bayonet through the heart and so forth uh, which is pretty horrible but you have you have to train soldiers that way and i remember that ver the very moment that day as crazy as it sounds when i suddenly thought realized for the first time i suddenly thought my God, I could get killed doing this. I'm probably going to get killed doing this. We're going to be sent to combat. The casualty rates are incredibly high. That was the day that I suddenly realized I might not come out of the war. As it turned out, I lucked out. My unit was held in reserve. So I did for luckily survive the war. So many people didn't. But yeah, that's one moment in basic training I will never forget. My God, I will probably get killed doing this. And I, I'm sure that, that comes to every soldier, or every military guy in training, particularly soldiers and Marines that are in, in combat, uh, infantry combat, that you, you could end up in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and very likely would. Um, and it was, it was not a pretty picture. So I'm sorry, I took a long time to answer your question. It's okay. Um, so I know you talked about the morale being really low. Why do you think that was? Was there maybe a reason that the morale was really low at the time? or? I can tell you exactly why I think it was, and it goes to the earlier comments I made about the difference from World War II. That was the first war where the country kind of turned their backs on the war and left the military uh, to fight it, and you'll, people will never know who haven't been through it, will never know how devastating that, I mean, it was... At least the Korean War, at least the public somewhat supported the war. Unlike the Vietnam War, when those poor soldiers came home and ended up as horrible as it was getting, in some cases, spit on by civilians back home, uh, made fun of, called baby killers. It got, it got worse in the Korean War. It was in the, we were seeing the first signs in the Korean War of what later became an absolute scandal of civilian treatment of the military. You'd, you'd go on, on leave in your uniform and you were proud of what you're doing for your country and you suddenly realize people don't really give a damn. They don't want to be bothered with the war. Uh, and in fact, in so many of the wars since World War II, we not only, us civilians have not been a part of it, we have been encouraged in many cases by our political leaders not to be a part of it. Go out, buy things. Don't ration things. We're not going to charge you higher taxes. We paid higher taxes in World War II to support the guy. We bought bonds. The contrary was prevent a depression, an economic depression. Everybody go out, live your lives like there was no war, spend money, have fun, let these guys fight it over there. And what percentage is it of the American young people that go that end up entering the military there's some ridiculous figure i think it I think it's maybe like two percent that end up going in and the ones who go in said with some notable exceptions uh guys from from uh so-called higher class uh, families that that do still go in but for the most part as we all know it's two percent of poor families that in the in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars couldn't find jobs in an economic depression had to go in people with not as much education that couldn't get civilian jobs that had to go in or uh, that, that 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 is I think scandalous and sad that only some tiny percentage of Americans still go to defend their country 
So I know you'd mentioned earlier, somebody had said when North Korea had attacked South Korea that it was communism might be trying to take over the world. So why do you, so, sorry, Han. So mm -hmm. how do you personally feel about communism at the time? Do you think it was a serious issue or it was something that had to be dealt with but it wasn't incredibly dangerous? Well, I've got two opposing feelings. I can tell you how I felt at the time and I can tell you how I feel now, now and, and shortly after the war. During the Korean War, as I said, it was at the height of McCarthyism with Senator McCarthy calling people movie stars, uh, army officers, State Department officials, calling them communists, putting them on trial before. Uh, could, could, it, it was horrible. And it was, it was frightening. We were all frightened. Nobody dared to say otherwise, or you would be suspected of being a communist. But people today don't realize it, didn't live through that. It was a, it was a frightening time. And I'll never, so in answer to your question, at that time during the Korean War, I absolutely was convinced that the world was gradually collapsing to communism uh, and that there was even a danger our country as as ridiculous as I, we were never any real danger I mean it was it's absurd looking back on it communism was a dead issue by that time in this country but you have to realize that during the Korean War in milit in army training films that we were shown in basic training they showed us films as I recall that sh I'll never forget them that showed a map of the world and showed country by country would turn red on the map. Start out with a white map. One by one would would uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, Russia, China, Vietnam, Korea, and it just showed them one by one turning red as communism took over the world, and it it scared the bejabbers out of us. It looked kind of like I t told you in World War II that most people don't realize today we came that close to losing the war in the in the first days uh in those days we were under the impression that we were under a similar danger from communism with these maps of the whole world turning red was it legitimate i don't know maybe it was maybe it wasn't but looking back on it um i i, I don't think uh, i think it was yes there was we had to be concerned about communism absolutely but looking back on it, we all know now, from today's perspective, communism was dying even as early as the Korean War. People were disillusioned with it around the world. People behind the Iron Curtain would have liked nothing better than to get out of it. But we were deluded into thinking, my God, the whole world is turning communist. So yes, in answer to your question, in the Army, those of us in the Army and civilians were were had the bejabber scared out of us by the the threat of communism rightly or wrongly so do you think that the war itself was the proper way to deal with this i guess so-called spread of communism as was thought at the time or do you think there might have been another option i i wish i could give you an answer i honestly don't know to this day there are i think some justifications for the we were defending south korea North Korea was communist, South Korea was not, and we had, uh, we had a line that we were defending uh, against encroaching communism. There appears to be no question whatsoever that North Korea did, in fact, invade South Korea. We had defense, mutual defense commitments. Uh, I, I think you perhaps can make a legitimate argument that we may have had no choice, but I'm not sure because so much of what we've later found out about those earlier wars after World War II, um, uh, as in the Vietnam War, we now know that we were deliberately misled by the Tonkin Gulf uh, incident that turned out. We now know, apparently, we pretty much created it ourselves as an excuse for a war. That causes you to start wondering about the earlier wars, but I've still got an open mind on that. I really don't know. So did you have a specific person, place, or event that was really impactful to you, or like most impactful that you can recall the best? Uh, at what at what stage? Uh, um, just any time during the war, just something preferably maybe towards the middle or closer to the end. So any, I'm sorry, rephrase the question again. So is there a person, a place, or event that you can recall most uh, as most impactful to you? 
Well, uh, hopefully this uh, this fits your your question, and it's it goes back to an earlier question you made about the morale, which I didn't uh, get into, but partly in answer to your new question, the reason I ended up I, I originally volunteered for the paratroops when I signed up. Then I was offered a job after basic training at Fort Jackson. Uh, in the 8th Infantry, non-paratroop non unit, I was offered a job that I accepted and uh, worked at at Fort Jackson for a few months. And then I ended up re-volunteering all over again for the Army Airborne and going to volunteering for jump school. And the reason I did this, and this maybe answers your question, was because the morale in the no reflection on the regular army units bless their hearts do a great job but in the korean war maybe it's not like that today but in the korean war the regular army units as i said morale was rock bottom it was depressing most of the people guys were draftees they didn't want to be there they made it very clear and the paratroop units were very much like the Marines. They were the elite, the Army's elite unit. It was an all-volunteer unit. You couldn't get in it unless you volunteered, unless you volunteered for so-called hazardous duty. You got $50 a month extra so-called hazardous duty pay for parachute jumping because in that, nowadays everybody goes out and does pleasure parachute jumping. But in those days, unless you were a pilot whose plane was going down, nobody except Army airborne troops had ever parachuted so it was it was in those days it was considered truly hazardous duty uh, and oh yeah the, the an incident remind me to come back to the tragic accident at fort bragg where paratroopers got chopped up in midair by a careening airplane i'll, I'll if you're interested I'll t that that was an intellible moment but in contrast with that the paratroops were the elite unit uh they had these. They had these great uniforms. I've got a picture. If you're interested, uh, I I can show you from those days. And they were guys that wanted to be there. They were gung ho. Everything was Geronimo gung ho. Uh, just full of spirit. In total contrast to the regular army in those days. And it was thr It was absolutely thrilling coming out of that depressing atmosphere of a basic training division going into a unit the 82nd airborne the so-called all-american it was sergeant york's old unit from world war one if you've seen the movie sergeant york great old movie um it, it, it was one of the legendary they, they still today refer to it as the famed 82nd airborne division you were so proud to be a part of that you were proud to put on the uniform you were proud to tell people you were and when you said you're in the 82nd people would go wow uh, uh kind of like people do today for uh for marines for example and uh Partly in answer to your question, yes, I remember the excitement when I first got in the Airborne in contrast to the depression of the basic training, of the thrill of being in a unit that was like, more like World War II with that feeling that we were all in this uh, together. But stop me if, if I'm taking too much time, but you asked for an indelible incident. And the reason it was considered hazardous duty, and probably still is today, while I was in jump school, <laughs> the worst possible time for it to happen, there was this absolutely gruesome accident where they, they with paratroops, they drop them in so-called serials. Uh, uh, they'll have a, a formation, a V formation, known as a serial, a V formation of, in those days, they were C-119 flying boxcars, would fly in a V formation, and the first serial would drop their jumpers, and they would fly on off, and then maybe 15 seconds later, the next serial would come in, and they would drop their uh, load of, of troopers. Then a third uh, serial would come in, and you'd end up literally with as many as three different levels of jumpers. You could look up in the sky, there would be a top level of jumpers floating down at one level at maybe 1, 1,200 feet, which is what we jump from. There would be another group at maybe 900 feet, uh, just to pick a figure, maybe another group lower than that. 
uh, for the for safety reasons to allow the first planes jumpers to get out of the way before the these were propeller driven planes in those days for the propeller driven next flight to come through what apparently nobody had stopped to think about or maybe they just gambled on taking the risk is what would happen if one of the second or third serial lost an engine causing them to nose down in one of the lower uh, levels of tr of troopers drifting down in their parachutes there were three different levels of them like a layer cake and it happened a, the, in the second or third serial a c-119 flying boxcar lost its one of its engines or two of them nose down i think i think it just lost one engine no they used to they used to call them said to say flying coffins because of the fact that the general rightly or wrongly the general conception was if you lost an engine on one of those c-119s you were in pretty bad shape so they called them flying coffins uh, and so a second or third serial plane lost its at least one engine note did nose down plowed through hundreds of paratroopers still in the air floating down with their spinning propellers chopped them up horrible acts chopped them up in the propellers sliced uh off their parachutes with the wings of the planes coming down they had they had i remember they had a board of safety or whatever the army calls it inquiry official inquiry where they call the savaya killed i seems to be a kill something like 17 19 paratroopers unfortunately while i'm in jump school reading about it in the papers uh, which didn't do a lot for morale. And um, the they had a board of inquiry, and one of the paratroopers, they asked him to testify as to what happened. And I'll never forget, he they said, Private Jones, or whatever his name was, tell us what happened. And he said, well, my parachute opened. I felt the opening shock. I counted, I counted 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, which you're supposed to do. I felt, he said, I felt the opening shock of the parachute opening, which you're supposed to watch for as if you could even miss it. And then he said, then I felt another opening shock. And I think to myself, whoa, there's something wrong. Two opening shocks. And I look up and there's no parachute over my head. The plane's wings or propellers had sliced it off and I'm plunging toward the ground. He pulls his emergency chute and saves himself by like 10 feet before he hit the ground. The rest of them, as they, as the paratroops used to put it, clobbered in. Uh, they had a gruesome sense of humor, um, but that that was a pretty frightening incident for a guy who was just about to make his first parachute jump, and it led to this strange feeling I'll never forget of walking through a jump school the last week, the last thing you, you, you did, first you did training jumps from the so-called I think it was the 35-foot tower, however many high you jump out of a tower onto a, a zip line like a lot of the kids do now for fun. Then you'd go to the 250-foot parachute tower, which had been copied after the 1939 World's Fair. You'll still see pictures of it. With, it looked like a huge radio station antenna with four arms, and they'd haul you up in a, in a real parachute and drop you in the parachute from a 250-foot tower. And then the last step was you made your first jump. And I'll never forget the feeling of, that you would walk through this warehouse and you had to pick, pick out your own chute. You entered at one end of the warehouse, and the warehouse was lined floor to ceiling with thousands of parachutes already packed and ready to go. You had to pick out one. <laughs> and we had just seen this horrible accident, and we knew that parachutes did occasionally fail. We did have guys killed from, as they would put it, clobbering in. Uh, we knew it was a risk, but I'll never forget walking through that warehouse on the first jump and starting to pick one parachute and thinking hmm, maybe that's the one that's not going to open i'd walk a little further and i'm going to wait till i get further down start to pick up and oh, no, something doesn't look no i don't like the crease in that one and finally you're at the end of it and the sergeant's saying you know branch for god's sake pick up a parachute so you just you had to end up grabbing one hoping to god that whoever packed it was uh, was doing the doing their job well so continuing on the topic of the parachuting, what was it like to jump out of a plane? 
it frankly scared the holy bejabbers out of me because this is another embarrassing confession that uh, I, I hate to make, but I was probably one of the few paratroopers in the 82nd Airborne Division that had acrophobia. I was petrified of heights. And people would say, wait a minute, you're, you're, you're petrified of high places and yet you volunteered for the paratroops? Well, I can't explain it. Yes, why the hell would... I can't... If I get on a tall, on a five-story building, I can't walk to the edge and look. I'm one of those that feels like I'm being sucked over the, the edge. But it turned out not to be nearly as bad. It, it scared the bejabbers out of me. As a matter of fact, if you're interested, I wrote... I have a copy of it in a scrapbook. Uh, I was asked to write an account of that first jump in jump school for the, the old Atlanta Journal Sunday Magazine section. I'll, I'll be happy to show you a copy of it uh, that the, the editors put a dramatic title on it, Whop Wham, something or other for the sounds of the parachute opening. And they asked me to describe what the shoot was like. Um, Jane will get that. Um, and... Um, it was terrifying, as I, I explained in that article, which you can see. The night before the first jump uh, in the barracks at Jump School at Fort Benning, Georgia, the we were right next to the uh, to the air, they had the Air Force Base. I think now it's all integrated into one base. In those days, the Air Force Base, whose name I can't remember, next to Fort Benning was right adjacent to our barracks because we had to use the the air force provided the planes we jumped out of and there was an aircraft beacon on the in those days they all the airports had that was before radar uh they the all the airports had red and green beacons that rotated all night long and i remember lying in the bed in the barracks and petrified that tomorrow morning i'm gonna make the first parachute jump and the I, I described in that article the red and blue beacon flashing across our bunks in the bear. You couldn't forget you were about to make the jump because it was red, green, red, and you're trying to go to sleep. And to make it worse, the the old timers, again, the, the paratroops had a, an, a, a, bless their hearts, they had a gruesome sense of humor, which probably was a good thing because that's probably what gets you through in, for example, in combat, if you don't keep a sense of humor, you probably will will never psychologically live through it. So the paratroops had a gruesome sense of humor where the night before the jump and and the night before you went to jump school, all the old timers would would come and measure your boot size and say and would roll dice to get your we, we had, uh, uh, as you'll see in a picture of me in the uniform back in those days we we the airborne wore jump boots with the bloused trousers with the high jump boots and they were kind of a symbol of the of the can do spirit and they would so they would come around and measure your boot size and roll dice as to when you clobbered in tomorrow morning <laughs> who was gonna get sounds kind of absurd nowadays when so many people sky jump for fun but uh, yeah, it it, uh, it it scared, but it turned out not to be nearly as bad uh, as I thought. I only, I only made 15 jumps. I only made the jumps I had. We were required to make one jump every three months to get hazardous duty pay. So once every three months, we had to go out and make a jump. And by that time, it, it wasn't so bad. And the reason, this is kind of interesting, maybe, the reason that it to a person with acrophobia who couldn't walk to the edge of a cliff and look over. The reason it wasn't really that scaring is because of the intense discipline, kind of like the Marine Corps does. They, the, the Airborne had very strict discipline, and part of the three weeks of jump school training was disciplining you to where when the jump master would say but they had a sequence you went through they'd say it had a sequence of lights that the pilot would flash when it was time to i think they had a a green light meant you can relax they had a yellow light that meant stand up and hook up you had a you hooked up your parachute to a a steel cable that would automatically unravel and automatically open the chute rather than only the emergency chute you had to open yourself. 
And uh, they had a routine they'd go through when the yellow light would go on, the jump master, who was in charge of each stick of jumpers of, I don't know, 15, 20 jumpers on each side of the plane. The, when the jump master would go through the sequence, stand up, we, will, we all... You had to instantly stand up. If you were a fraction of a second late, you had to drop for 10 push-ups uh, in, in jump school. Uh, the next uh, it was stand up, then hook up. And if you weren't hooked up with your static line to the steel cable within a fraction of a second, you had in training, not in an actual jump, obviously. You had to drop down and do 10. And when they said go or whatever the command was to jump i i think it was go and they'd slap you on your buttocks and, and that meant and if you didn't in training if you didn't get out the in the mock tower the 34 foot tower if you didn't jump instantly if you're you were in a crouch and when he slapped you on the buttocks and said go if you didn't instantly jump it was like <laughs> 50 push-ups or whatever and the result is that by the time you got up to make the very first jump, your legs automatically went. By that time, you'd done it so many times. Jump, slap you on the buttocks. Even You didn't think about it. Your legs, you're in a crouch. Your legs would spring up and out the door. And that the discipline took the fear of it away. You were so intent on obeying the commands that you, you didn't have time really to be scared. But it, it was, I'll have to admit, that four seconds of plunging through the air, waiting for the, sh wondering if the chute was going to open. Uh, and the, the, the problem, I hope I'm not taking too much of your time here, but the problem, it may be an interesting problem, the problem was that unlike sky, sky jumpers, kids that do it for fun now, I, think, I don't know what, exact time they jump from pretty high altitude so they got plenty of time to open an emergency chute most people don't know it the paratroops drop from just 1200 feet think about it that's not much more than the height of the channel 3 television tower that you pass down here in um, the rio vista wherever it is not much higher than a radio station <laughs> transmission tower and that means you, you had to, to time it so you knew when to pull the emergency ripcord. You had to count 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, four seconds. And as I recall, if you didn't feel it was a tr huge opening shock, when that, unlike what the skydivers use, a relatively gentle parachute, but the Army, but in those days, it was an old-fashioned World War II parachute design called the... I think they called it the T5, if I remember, shoot, as opposed to the later T7 that opened a bit more gently. It would open so abruptly, it would it would literally break people's sternum bones. In fact, I think I still to this day have a sternum bone because you had a metal quick-release thing here on your chest to release the main chute if it didn't open to get out of it. Uh, and... Um, um, now strike that to release it when you got the on the ground before they sh the enemy shot you, and that it would open with such force it would knock you out regularly. People would get knocked out from the force of that thing. You you're going, I don't know, 150 miles an hour, and wham, you're slammed to nothing when the chute opens. You can it was a, an enormous shock, and if you didn't have your head down, the these huge metal D rings would come roaring out of the backpack of the parachute and they would take the back of your head off you would train to keep your head down so they could clear your head or they could literally take the back of your skull off so it, it was it was still a, a kind of a frightening experience but not nearly as frightening as a a, a guy with acrophobia would have thought so we're going to start shifting more towards like the end of the war. Mm -hmm. And so what was it like to readjust back to civilian life after being in the Army? Well, for me, not having, if I'd been in combat, I'm sure like combat guys coming home today or combat guys coming home from World War II, you name it, uh, they, they have a tremendous adjustment. I was stateside. I wasn't in combat. For me, it was... It, it was a, not only an easy adjustment, it was a welcome adjustment. By after almost three years of service, I, I needed to get back to college. Uh, I was looking forward. I got, 
a lot of us got released three months early because the war had ended and they were downsizing uh, the army. So I, I had I had no no problems at all. It was I, I was glad to have the service behind me. I enjoyed it oddly enough in a lot of ways, but no problems. So do you think that your personality might be different if you hadn't volunteered for the military service, whether as if you had been drafted? That's an excellent question. Um, darn good question. I, yeah, I think it would. I, I think it would be. A, I, th I think every kid, that, even in peacetime, that goes in the military and does two or three years of military. Um, yeah, I, I think we all come out of the military uh, hopefully better than when we went in. In the case of some combat veterans, no, they come out worse, tragically, tragically worse. But for those of us lucky enough uh, not to have been sent into combat, um, yeah, you, you mature. I've seen so many kids go into the military, I, and I was an example. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for college. I was I was flunking out of college. wasn't ready to sit down and study. was undisciplined, and uh, yeah, like a lot of kids, I came out of the military uh, much more disciplined, um, and uh, it, it gives a kid a chance to grow and mature. Uh, uh, I think it's a good thing as long as you're lucky enough not to be in combat. But um, God help you if you're in combat. It's going to probably change your life enormously. So did you learn any life lessons from being in the military? Well, heck yeah. One of them I just mentioned. I, I, I switched almost instantly from being a born segregationist in the Deep South to being the only known integrationist in my Deep South college after I got out of the military. Huge change from, I'm sure, to a considerable extent from having lived with blacks in the Army and seeing that, hey, it works. Um, it works very well. Um, it... Um, what was the question again? I don't want to get. Have you learned any life lessons? Oh yeah, um, that that was one life lesson. Um, another life lesson I think is that you you do have to whether you're in combat or non-combat in the military, it's 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 one for all, all for one. You, that you have an obligation to your military unit, your, your unit, military, the other guys have an obligation to you to help protect you. You have an obligation to help protect their lives uh, and that the whole unit uh, is in it together. That's something that I don't think you ever experience quite to that extent in civilian life, although maybe to some extent. Um, Life-changing, um, Corny as it sounds, I think you come out with a much greater appreciation to the obligations that you have to your country. Um, that um, in, in, in John Kennedy's famous words, it's not what your country can do for you, it's, it's what you can do for your country. And bless their hearts, a lot of kids that didn't go into the military, that went into the Peace Corps, came out with very much the same sort of uh, thing. I think the Peace Corps was a, a, was a wonderful substitute for universal military training. So I, I heard you mention the Peace Corps, but I'm not sure if there was anything else. What did you do after military service, and did the military service impact your decisions uh, after, impact your decisions for a job after the military? Well, one thing it did is it gave me the GI Bill, like the World War II vets. Uh, it put me through college. When I came out, I'd been in in wartime. I got my college was largely paid for in those days. College tuition was maybe a hundredth of what it is today. It's obviously out of sight today. So the army put me through college, gave me an education. Uh, it gave me the discipline to settle down and study. I'd been flunking out of college before I went in the army. Um, it. Um, yeah, it, 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 it did have uh, some healthy effects, I think. Right, so we noticed that you're married. Did you meet 
your wife after or before you were in the army? No, I met her long afterward. I met her um, after I after I got out of college. I uh, um, <laughs> I had this I had this crazy wacky idea. I was studying German, and I got enthralled. This is a little off the subject, so I'll make it real short. But I got enthralled with the German concept, student concept of the Wanderjahr, the Wander Year, where in earlier days German students would take a year off after college to work their way around Europe, seeing the land, experiencing people. And I decided crazy as it was I wanted to do the same thing so I left uh, Atlanta with an old car and I think six hundred dollars in my pocket that was all and I set out to spend a year working my way around the country at odd jobs I worked on the wheat harvest in Kansas I worked on two cattle ranches in Wyoming and Montana worked on forest fire crews etc finally ended up stopping in California, f absolutely falling in love with California, stopped in, this was San Francisco uh, long before the hippies and the flower children. It was actually back in the, in the very earliest so-called beatnik days when the, the uh, San Francisco was famous uh, for Jack Kerouac and uh, so forth, the great writers, and absolutely fell in love with San Francisco. It was to a kid out of the Deep South. I'd never seen an espresso machine. I had never seen, you name it, uh, a, a gourmet restaurants we, we didn't have in the Deep South. It was, it was pretty much cornbread and grits and ham or whatever. Uh, and uh, absolutely fell in love with California. It was an exci tremendously exciting. California in those days was doing the, 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 the water project that was so big you could see it from the moon. Uh, one of the most fantastic, I mean, yeah, it was spellbinding what California, they, California had instituted the master plan for education where you could get, I knew I could get, the, the dream went away. I knew I could get a free college education for my kids if they had the gray. The, that's all gone now. But so I ended up settling in, in California. And that was the point at which I met my wife to answer your questions. Um, she was a, a riding instructor in Elk Grove. And I'd gotten interested in rodeo in those days, <laughs> like a crazy kid, till I realized I almost broke my neck doing it and decided maybe that wasn't so smart after all. And I decided to switch to English writing, and she was my English writing teacher out in Elk Grove in those days. All right, so we had a couple driving questions that the project had been based on, and so we thought we probably should bring them up. So with war, how can, with all of its destruction, could it be beneficial in a way? Well, I, I think this. I think we'd all agree World War II was incredibly beneficial. We not only saved our country from, as I said, that close to invasion and defeat, uh, but look at the wonders that we worked in the world after. And and this is what a, a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the younger generation. I wish they could have experienced the other aspect of World War II. That when we came out of World War II. We were looked up to by the entire, we were the world's hero. We had saved Europe from Nazism. We had liberated France. We had liberated Germany. We had liberated Italy. I remember when I was in the, well, this might go back to the military. When I was in the 82nd Airborne, slight aside, I wound up with a month of furlough time I had to burn up before I got discharged. And somebody said, well, well Branch, why don't you hop a free army flight, military flight to Europe and spend a month wandering around Europe. So I did. You could get space available flights. Hopped a military flight free of charge, luxury first class flight to uh, Frankfurt, Germany out of Washington, D.C. Spent a month traveling around Europe. And they told me in those days, and this is the, this is what vanished shortly after World War II. They told me, I, di I, I didn't end up doing it, didn't end up going to Normandy, where the 82nd had liberated the French in Normandy, France, from the Nazis. But this was, what, 1955? This was ten, only 10 years after World War II. Ink parts of London were still bombed out when I was there. Parts of Germany, when I was there, were still ruins in the streets. They were still clean. I mean, the war was fresh, 10 years out of the war. And people told me when I was in the 82nd, you, you had to wear your uniform to hop a, 
a military flight, but you could go into civilian clothes otherwise in Europe. And somebody said, you have got to, I didn't do it, I wish I, somebody said, you have got to experience this incredible experience. And I get a little teary-eyed talking about this, but they said, if you will wear your 82nd Airborne Division with the AA All-American patch on it to Normandy, particularly places like saint mary Glise that the 82nd freed and liberated from the Nazis. That was the thing you've seen in the, in the, the Longest Day movie, the paratrooper that got caught on the church steeple in, in saint mary Glise. That was the 82nd. And he said, if you wear your uniform now, 10 years after the war, People in Normandy will not let you pay for a meal. They will not let you pay for a drink. They will not let you pay for a hotel room. They are so, you, the 82nd is heroes to them. You are such, even though I wasn't there in World War II, my unit was, they, they said, you are, you are incredible heroes to this people and they can't do enough for you. And that's to answer your question. That was the feeling. What, what did we accomplish by the war? What did, what did we gain from the war? We came out of the war being treated like heroes by the entire world. That's gone now. Now the world, unfortunately, may be unjustified. Too much of the world regards us as, as threats or whatever. But we were heroes to the world. Our, our, the dollar was the strong. Every nation pegged its money to our money. When you went to Europe, you know, the, the, everybody wanted your dollars. They didn't want their native currency. The American dollar was, it was, it was an incredible feeling. We were, we were like coming out of World War II. We were what ancient Rome was to, to the ancient uh, world. We were the, when Rome was, was the, was the he was the glorification of, of of the ancient world and anybody in Rome was you were it. Well we, we were the Rome of post World War II and it lasted for ten or fifteen years. So yeah, that's one of the things. We we came out of World War II with the United Nations. Because as you know, in the early stages of the war, a lot of folks don't realize this. Franklin Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, beginning early in the war, because because we had gotten into World War II, partly because we refused to join the League of Nations at the end of World War II, uh, uh, Woodrow, President Woodrow Wilson, as you know, died traveling around the country, pleading with the country, to, because Congress was very isolationist, reactionary. They killed the League of Nations. He died pleading with America to join it. He never succeeded. And we got into World War II. Franklin Roosevelt reminded us during the war, partly because we wouldn't join the League of Nations that might have had a chance of stopping the Nazis if we had been members of it. So we came out of World War II with the creation of the United Nations, World War II, sadly, was going to be like World War I, the war that ended all wars. The United Nations was going to ensure a peaceful world, and we were naive enough to believe it in those days. It was, it, I can't tell you how exciting that was. Uh, so what, inventions that we came out of World War II that were wartime inventions, uh, uh, whether it's jet aircraft or uh, you name it, I'd bore you if I listed all the the inventions. We we they ra radar um, was was unknown before World War II. So we're very kind of close to the uh, max mm -hmm. amount of time. But is there anything that came that didn't come up in the interview that you would like to share or talk about? Oh, good question. Uh, I think you've I think you've covered it pretty well. Are there any other? Questions you would? Uh, I think we've uh, covered pretty much everything we're kind of going for. Mm -hmm. Well, let me. Uh, can I think for just half a minute? I, I think you've. I think you've covered it. Um, yeah, I. Th I think as as I've said in in other so many words, I think the most significant thing to me about the Korean War is that, as I've said, that it was the line of demarcation, the red line that, that divided the two wars to end all wars when the nation was, was totally
totally united to police action wars largely where the nation turned largely turned its back and left it to a small number of people to do the fighting and i i don't know i'm i'm i was a history major in college i i love history and i think that was that was a major turning point in history when when uh, when we lost that i'd love to see us get it back again and i think part of what that speaks to the 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 fact that that world war ii was the last war that we were all in it together i think that's one of the tragic mistakes this country has made in recent wars i i'm one of those that think having lived through world war ii and been involved in the korean war um i think this country should never ever go to war unless we are willing to put the entire country behind it you don't go to war if you're not if the people are not going to support it a hundred percent if we don't you shouldn't go to war unless you absolutely ha it should be an absolute last resort you should use every other wars are horrible i it sounds obvious and corny but too many people don't stop to look at what happened to the combat guys in iraq and afghanistan tragic what it's done to those wounded veterans you don't ask a man to put his life on the line or to risk serving risk living the rest of his life a half century as a cripple a, a psychologically damaged because he went to defend the war and the rest of us weren't in there right beside him backing it up it sh it should always be an absolute last resort and it hasn't been since world war ii and i think that's one of the saddest mistakes we ever i think if this country could go back turn the clock back to world war ii and say never again will we be involved in any war except as an absolute iraq we, I, I, I was one of those who said when we went into Iraq, I, I had just finished reading, I got very interested in Lawrence of Arabia, uh, who obviously was felt betrayed uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in World, War, um, World War II, and he ended up being very bitter about it. And I just spent a lot of time reading a lot of books about Lawrence of Arabia, about the... the, the stupid mistake the English made by getting involved in Iraq and the English wanted unfortunately I guess Tony Blair took him into it anyway but the English knew they had made a mistake they made a horrible mistake it cost them treasure it cost them lives and they ended up with the people in Iraq hating the English's guts because Iraq Iraq was a create cre Iraq was never a real country Iraq was artificially created by the English at the end of World War I in 1919, artificially created out of what had been uh, Baghdad and, and uh, um, what's the Mesopotamia. And instead of saving that country, it created hatred that we are living with to this day. They are still blowing up our troops or were until recently in Iraq because not just of their feeling that we in, came in when we they thought we had no big but because of what the English did to them for so many years subjugating them the English putting in rulers over them not letting them choose their own rulers horrible mistake and as a student of history and a guy who was reading about Lawrence of Arabia infuriated at the betrayal of those people by the English uh, that's why he ended up turning his back on his all of his glory and going in the military anonymously as an anonymous enlisted man because he said we betray I made promises to those people and we betrayed we, that we didn't learn from the experience of the English and we went in and did it all over again in a war that we absolutely did not have to fight we know now there were no weapons of mass destruction if we had said we uh, we will never go into a war unless it's absolutely necessary how many young Americans would be alive and in one piece today that died for I'm sorry they died for nothing they didn't have to be there that's that's what we learned by World War II. All right. Well, I think we're out of time, but we'd like to thank you. This was really a great <clears throat> experience to be able to interview you, and thank you for all the things you shared. Oh, you're more than welcome. I hope it's of some use to you. It'll be, it'll be very good use.